Black Wall Street. Unless you've been living under a rock for the past 100 years, you've definitely heard of it. Whether it's in a song, or the news, or a film, Black Wall Street is met with reverence whenever you mention or see it. Or is it? If you have HBO, you may have seen Black Wall Street in Lovecraft Country or Watchmen. In both of these shows, we see that Black Wall Street was tragically destroyed by angry white mobs, but we barely get a glimpse as to what actually made Black Wall Street special in the first place. Well, today, we're going to put some respect on its name. We're going to put you on as to why Black Wall Street in the 1920s was such a hotspot, which unfortunately made it a target. Let's talk about Black Wall Street. So when we first began researching Black Wall Street, we needed to set a stable historical foundation before we did anything. So we read a few books, watched a few docs, scoured several web pages, and got a good idea of the origins of Oklahoma, then Black Wall Street, and the key individuals who helped contribute to it. Once we did that, we got in contact with a few locals who reside in Tulsa, who then put us in contact with Carlos Moreno and Hannibal B. Johnson. Feeling good about our foundation, we hopped on a plane to Tulsa, Oklahoma. We experienced the city, got the details, and put together today's episode that focuses on a few game changers who played an important part in the rise and the rebuilding of the Greenwood District. The year is 1889. The Civil War ended well over 20 years ago, and African Americans are no longer living in slavery. At this time, Oklahoma has been recognized as a safe haven for Black people who have been living cohesively with Native Americans on Indian territory. Around then, a settler named Edwin McCabe moves to Oklahoma, where he and his colleagues would try to establish the first only Black state in America. Their plan ultimately failed, but McCabe's effort left an influence on the pursuit of Black economic wealth and the development of all Black towns across the United States. Fast forward to 1905, the Black population in Tulsa bloomed to about 55,000, gaining the attention of Black activist and educator Booker T. Washington. Truly impressed on the success of this city and how well it was financially thriving, he coined it Negro Wall Street, AKA Black Wall Street. I understand why, why it was called Black Wall Street, but a better label would have been Black Main Street because what, what was really there was not banking and investment companies these were small businesses, mom and pop type operations, much more like a main street economy. And it existed and it was successful because it had to. Imagine black folks literally walking to the gate of the mainstream downtown Tulsa economy and somebody shutting the gate on them before they can enter. That's segregation. So they turned around and they went essentially went back home and started their own economy. This brings us to the first game changer we're highlighting, O.W. Gurley. See, that same year, a wealthy and well-connected African-American landowner named O.W. Gurley moves to Tulsa, Oklahoma from Arkansas. He too shared the ideologies of Booker T. Washington and wanted to contribute to building an all-black city of Greenwood. Gurley purchased over 40 acres of land in North Tulsa with the intentions of exclusively selling to African-Americans. One of Gurley's earlier establishments was a boarding house which would be a place of refuge for African-Americans who were migrating from other Southern states. That's not only a black millionaire in the early 1900s, that's a black millionaire who used his wealth to change Oklahoma forever. Another notable successful business owner of this time was J.B. Stratford. Arriving in the early 1900s, attorney J.B. Stratford and his wife Augusta set on a quest to find success in the all black community of the Greenwood District. Sharing similar goals to build a successful city, Stratford teamed up with O.W. Gurley to achieve this goal. Together, they invested in land, rental properties, and sold to other Black Tulsa residents. For almost two decades, Stratford was seen as one of the most successful businessmen in Greenwood. In 1917, he built the Stratford Hotel, which was the largest Black-owned hotel in America at that time. According to an article in Forbes, the hotel had 54 suites, a gambling hall, a dining room, saloon, and a pool hall. The luxury hotel valued at $75,000, or about $2.5 million today. 
JB Stratford, along with O.W. Gurley, really dealt quite a bit in the land. So these men had um, a considerable amount of wealth. They would quite literally just buy and sell land and that's how they built up the community of Greenwood and how they, they made their wealth. And it was almost kind of like this friendly competition. So Gurley would buy a bunch of land and then Stratford would buy a bunch of land. And then Gurley would build a hotel and Stratford would build a better hotel. The Stratford Hotel uh, during its time um, was known nationally as being the most luxurious black owned hotel in the country. Not only did Stratford have influence over real estate, he also applied his background in law. He pressed the importance of standing up and fighting against the lynching of African Americans and holding local police accountable for their participation in the violence. Part of this work led him to cross paths with other local activists, one of which was A.J. Smitherman. A.J. Smitherman's story in Greenwood starts in 1913 when he moved there with his family. Smitherman quickly made a connection with J.B. Stratford and their goals to stand up against the mistreatment of African Americans. With the help of Stratford's funding, Smitherman created a politically conscious newspaper, Tulsa Star. The Tulsa Star was known to write investigative and informative stories, including those of injustice in neighboring cities. In 1917, Smitherman visited Dewey, Oklahoma, where 20 African American homes were burned down. As a result of the article, 36 people, including the city's mayor, were arrested in relation to the crime. Smitherman continued to visit other neighboring cities, writing articles of the injustices that took place. A.J. Smitherman is most well known uh, for founding the Tulsa Star. And the Tulsa Star is the oldest black newspaper in Tulsa, but it's the first weekly black newspaper in the country, which is pretty significant uh, for him to have accomplished that. And he actually had a journalism career prior to moving to Tulsa. He worked with another journalist who was also an attorney named uh, W.A. Twine. The most significant work that they did was uncovering what was called the guardianship racket. And what would happen is if you were um, a white person and you wanted to take land from a native family or a black freedman family who had land allotments in Indian territory at the time, all you really had to do was go to a judge and just say, well, Jasmine is not fit to be the guardian of her own children. So I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna be the guardian. And if a judge agreed with that, he would just sign the papers and that person would become the guardian of those children. What came with that was all of their land rights and all the mineral rights that came with that. So you had separation of families that was happening in order to take the land that belonged to native and um, black freedmen families. So this was a really important piece of investigative journalism that Twine and Smitherman were working on in the late 1890s, early 1900s, you know, just as, as early as that. See, if there was a Mount Rushmore of Black Wall Street, it would feature these three dudes right here. But they weren't the only heavy hitters around, which brings us to Black Wall Street's notable modern day power couple, John Wesley and Lula Tom Williams. Arriving in the Greenwood District in 1903, the couple began making quite a name for themselves. In 1909, Wesley was employed with the Thompson Ice Cream Company, working with steam-powered chilling equipment. Making a sizable income in this position, Wesley was able to purchase the first car in Greenwood in 1911. This increased John's interest in the mechanics of automobiles and repairs, which led him to a side hustle of fixing his neighbor's cars. Due to the success of his side hustle, John eventually quits the ice cream company and opens up his own auto repair service, known as Williams One Stop Garage. While John was running his auto repair service, Lula fed her own entrepreneurial spirit and opened up a candy shop, Williams Confectionery. Known for its sweet treats, sodas, and ice cream, Williams Confectionery was a popular meeting spot for teens and young adults. As business grew through the couple's individual businesses, so did their ideas for expansion. They began investing in real estate as well as purchasing theaters within the city. One notable theater was the Williams Dreamland Theater, where Greenwood residents would gather and watch movies, but also served as a community center where residents would protest, meet, and discuss plans for protection and fight against the grips of Jim Crow. Lula Williams was 
actually the real entrepreneur of the family. She owned um, multiple confectionaries. The biggest one was right on the corner of Archer and Greenwood. It was said, you know, back in sort of the height of Greenwood before 1921, that there were more marriage proposals at Lulu Williams Confectionary than anywhere else in Tulsa. Her famous theater is the Williams Dreamland Theater in Greenwood. But to my knowledge, she's the first person, not the first black person, but the first person to own a chain of movie theaters. She had Williams Dreamland Theater in Greenwood, but she also had a Dreamland Theater in Muskogee and Mogi. The last significant figure of the illustrious Greenwood district we want to highlight is Dr. Andrew C. Jackson. Already an established doctor and surgeon, Dr. Jackson quickly opened his medical practice upon his arrival to Tulsa in 1913. His family was well known in the community due to Tulsa Star editor and his neighbor, A.J. Smitherman, who was fond of their works in the medical field. Smitherman had written quite a few articles about the Jackson family and the Tulsa Star. By 1918, Dr. Jackson had a strong reputation among both black and white residents in Tulsa, serving both races as his patients, which was particularly rare at that time. That same year, he met with Tulsa's mayor about opening the Booker T. Washington Hospital for Negroes to serve the underserved community of black Americans. To this day, Surgical tools Dr. Jackson innovated are still being used. There were a few doctors in Greenwood. Dr. A.C. Jackson was probably the most prominent. He was recognized, for example, by the Mayo Clinic and the original founders of the Mayo Clinic, the Mayo Brothers, really celebrated him as being just one of the best um, doctors that they you know, knew about. So here's this national institution that is saying to the entire country that one of the best doctors they know is Dr. A.C. Jackson in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, which is pretty significant. He didn't care, you know, what color your skin was. If you were sick, he would treat you, you know, and that's just sort of the culture that he came from, the family that he came from, and just the spirit of Greenwood at the time was, was that just very accepting and welcoming spirit. It's, it's kind of interesting that Greenwood accepted you no matter who you were, but it was the rest of Tulsa that was, that segregated itself away from the black community. While this is a lesson about black wins, we have to also tell you about the destruction that took place. As we mentioned earlier in the episode, the Greenwood district was tragically destroyed by an angry white mob on May 31st, 1921. The massacre lasted 17 hours. Hundreds died. Thousands of homes and businesses were decimated and the property damage added up to more than $4 million. But the story doesn't end here. As a matter of fact, the part of the story that doesn't get the love that it deserves is that they rebuilt the Greenwood District. And it wasn't easy, but they did it. And Greenwood thrived for another 40 years until two things happened but it began to decline in the 60s through the 70s and 80s. Why? You have black people in this black community that has a successful business component. They're working to have a more integrated world where they can do, do the things that white people do. They can shop in shops that have been closed to them and all that. That sounds great. It is great. But the reality is, if you're pushing for integration, what you're really pushing for is the ability for dollars to flow outside the black community. White people aren't trampling one another to get in and spend their dollars in the black community. So the financial foundation of the black community suffers. The other thing that happened during this period, 60s, 70s, is urban renewal. Highway projects were located in communities of color. So in the Greenwood District and Black Wall Street in Tulsa, the highway, Interstate 244, comes right through the heart of what was a successful business community. Had a devastating impact. It disunites the community. It disconnects the community. It displaces business and homes in the community. So where does this leave us today? Well, on our trip there, we realized that there's a lot going on in Greenwood. So we're working on a second part of our Black Wall Street coverage that will highlight the legacy and the future of Greenwood. But before we peace out, we wanted to leave you with three key takeaways that we all can learn from the story of Black Wall Street. Number one is that this isn't a story about a riot, massacre, or destruction. 
This is a story about the resilience of the human spirit, showing that in even the worst conditions that a phoenix can rise from the ashes. Number two, Black Wall Street was destroyed, but it was rebuilt, and we don't talk about that enough. And three, is that this story of Black Wall Street isn't over. The Greenwood District cannot be held down, and we are super excited to tell you guys what's going down on Black Wall Street in 2021. So keep it locked. We hope that you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see y'all next time.